So I really, really like today because we get to talk 49ers defensive line. This is the heart and the soul of this football team. And I think it has been ever since 2017 when Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch took over. There was an organizational philosophy, and at the core of that philosophy was the goal to make the defensive line as strong as possible. In fact, we should probably start with what John Lynch said back in the 2019 offseason after the 49ers had acquired both Nick Bosa and E. Ford. And actually, I finished this article on The Athletic talking about the defensive line with Lynch's quote, which came, what, now three seasons ago. Three seasons have happened since John Lynch said this, and here it is. We want to become a dominant force there. We think that's very important. It can change the course of a game. It can change the course of a season. We have the opportunity to do that with our group. We still have to go do it, but you keep adding pieces, and our expectation is to be special there. That's John Lynch in 2019. So he says we still have to go do it back then. Well, the 49ers obviously did do it. We've seen a good defensive line from this team in each of the past three seasons. And I think you could even go back to 17 and 18 where they had some really nice pieces up front. And, and we're getting the job done in general, good run defenses in those years. But obviously the rest of the 49ers were so talent deficient that it didn't really show. It first started to truly show in 2019. Injuries made it tough in 2020, but Chris Kosarek still made it sing with guys like Kerry Hyder Jr., and here in 2021, we just saw an awesome developmental performance from the defensive line. They started below average in weeks one to seven, and they finished as possibly the best unit in the league or close to it, especially in weeks 14 to the conference championship game. So Chris Kosarek, pay him what he wants. He's still the 49ers D-line coach. He really turned this unit into what the 49ers need. And if you hear Lynch talk more often about the defensive line, that is a dominant unit is what they need. They can't just be good up front. They are so rooted philosophically in rush over coverage and stopping the run and everything that goes with that, that the 49ers need their defensive line to be dominant to execute the type of game plans that they want to execute. A good defensive line is simply not enough for this team. The 49ers have to be dominant and they realized and actualized that dominance down the stretch of this 2021 season. And that's one of the main reasons why the 49ers turned it around and made it just short of the Super Bowl in the postseason. So that's what we're going to break down today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Right here at the bottom of the screen, you see the 2021 49ers D-line, a tale of three phases. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, hopefully you've already read the article. If you're a subscriber to The Athletic, You've clicked on the link that I'm about to put into the comment section. $1 a month right now for The Athletic. So it's in the chat section, comment section coming up after this video is live. I'll pin it there. You click on that link. You can sign up for a dollar a month at Athletic. And you can check out the State of the 49ers defensive line piece where I talk about the three phases that the 49ers defensive line went through this season. And you're about to see them on your screen. Here are the 49ers 2021 splits in pass rush productivity, which comes from Pro Football Focus. Now, those of you who are familiar with my tables know that darker red means further below average. Darker blue means further above average. So in any of these tables, you're going to want more blue and you're going to want that blue to be darker. Well, these are all of the 49ers defensive linemen divided up into three columns. The first column is pass rush productivity, which measures sacks, quarterback hits and pressures in weeks one to seven. Then you have pass rush productivity splits in weeks eight to the NFC title game. And then you have weeks 14 to the NFC title game. And look how staggering this chart is. Weeks one to seven, it's majority red. Most of the 49ers defensive linemen, with the exception of Bosa and Armstead, I mean, Amenahu was above average, but he wasn't even playing for them. He was on the Texans. So everybody except for Bosa, Armstead, and Ford was below average in weeks one to seven. And then all of a sudden, they just kick it into gear. Week eight onward, majority blue. People are above average. And then you want to even you know further zoom in. Week 14 onward, that was the week that they sacked Joe Burrow five times. The 49ers are almost exclusively above average. And week 14 onward, I would say they had the best pass rush in football. They sacked Burrow five times in week 14. They sacked Matt Stafford 
five times in week 18. They sacked Dak Prescott five times in the wild card game, and they sacked Aaron Rodgers five times in the NFC Divisional Playoffs. That's four separate games with five sacks for the 49ers down the stretch run, 32 total sacks from weeks 14 onward. Would have been a pace for a good 68 sack season, I think. Uh, uh, Pardon me if my math is incorrect. But basically, you saw a defensive line that was below average in weeks one to seven turn into a defensive line that was at the top of the league from weeks 14 onward. So that's what Chris Kacarek was able to accomplish with this group of players. And we're going to break down how exactly that happened in this video today. First of all, Chris Kacarek is obviously worth his weight in gold. Defensive line coach for the 49ers showed up in 2019. And over the course of the past three seasons, the wide nine that he's implemented has allowed the 49ers to take their pass rush to new levels. Now, the wide nine is an aggressive defensive formation. It is exactly what it sounds like. You are stretching those defensive linemen out to use the width of the field along the offensive line. It's going to leave big gaps in between each individual body. So it puts a lot of pressure, especially on the defensive tackles, to be able to control and neutralize the run game, working in more space. So they may get double teamed if they're defensive tackles, but they still have to be athletic enough to make sure that gashing holes are not created by the offense to be able to just run through the defense. Because you can only pass rush when you earn the opportunity to pass rush, meaning that you have to stop the run. So your tackles have to be athletic. They have to be strong. They have to be good. Your linebackers have to be fast to clog any of those potentially wide gaps left by the wide nine. And then if both of those things happen, your edge rushers can eat. They can sit down and they can feast because they're lined up wider than the tackle. And if you've got at least one power, you know, one power rusher and one speed rusher, and they could play, you know, a good amount of snaps, then you could mix and match and do a bunch of crazy stuff to really put the strain on opposing offenses. But it takes a whole team effort. It takes glue to make it happen. You have to stop the run to earn those pass rushing situations. And most of all, from the 49ers perspective, you need somebody like Chris Kacarek to be able to bind the whole effort together. You also need somebody like Nick Bosa, who's one of the best players in football, including the playoffs this year. Nick Bosa had 19 and a half sacks. The fact that he got no votes for comeback player of the year is a joke. He was playing at a higher level than any of the quarterbacks who were considered for comeback player of the year this season, who obviously got votes this season. I love what Joe Burrow did. Dak Prescott also came off a very serious injury, but let's be honest, Prescott, who did get votes for comeback player of the year, was mediocre over the back half of the season. He was downright bad against the 49ers in the wild card game. Nick Bosa played as one of the best players in football the season after shredding his ACL. So I know these awards are skewed toward the quarterback position. There's bias there, but I think this was as clear cut as it gets. You look at the guy who's playing the best level of football at his respective position. And of course there's going to be an apples and oranges comparison. And then you, you, you judge the comeback player of the award, the comeback player of the year award based on that in a just world. That's what would happen. And at the very least, I I get it. You could be super impressed with what Joe Burrow did. He came back from a serious knee injury too. At the very least, Burrow wins the award, but Nick Bosa needs votes. And the fact that Nick Bosa didn't get any votes shows the bias of the award. But enough about, you know, extracurricular awards at the end of the season. Let's talk about play. Nick Bosa was better in 2021 than he was in 2019. He's on an upward trajectory. The 49ers are going to have to pay him. Will it happen this offseason? Probably. They say that they budgeted for it. It's interesting because the 49ers might have some contractual leverage here because Nick Bosa still has one more year of his rookie deal left, and then he's got the fifth-year option. So those are both going to come at fixed prices. Those prices represent the leverage that the 49ers have because they're going to be a downward pull in any contract negotiation, similar to what we saw with the potential franchise tag and George Kittle. But there already is talk of Nick Bosa potentially becoming the first defensive lineman who makes more than $30 million per year. Will that happen? I don't know. The downward pull in those contract negotiations could prevent that. Maybe he's at 29, but maybe he holds out and really wants to be at 30. 
We'll see how it plays out. I'll do a whole separate video on that. But the bottom line is that Nick Bosa is worth it. You saw the difference in the 49ers defense between 2020 when they were good with all those guys hurt and 2021 and 2019, obviously, when Bosa's in there, when he's firing, when the rest of the guys are playing at decent replacement level. I mean, this turns into a unit that you could really count on if you're the 49ers. And 19 and a half sacks is nothing to laugh at, especially considering the fact that Bosa was double teamed so often. He was double teamed more than any other edge rusher in all of football, and he still delivered right here. Look at the pass rush productivity for him. Second second row, he was 8.8, .8, which is a top 10 number for weeks 1 to 7. 10.0 and 9.9, .9, those are both top five numbers for weeks 8 and then weeks 14 onto the conference championship game. That despite being the most double teamed edge rusher in football. So Bosa draws attention. Chip blocks, double teams, triple teams. I mean, it was it got comical there toward the end, how much the Rams were paying attention to him. And while he does that, that's why the rest of these guys started improving over the course of the season. Because Bosa drew all that attention, and then you start to see Ebucom getting better. 9.1, 9.4, it's a great number. Arden Key, we'll talk about him in a little bit. 10.1 and 9.8 late in the season. I mean, he became a, a premier situational pass rusher the point where he's earned some money he's going to be a free agent next month charles and menahu was was doing work i mean bosa is one of the cogs that makes this all click another cog that makes this all click but isn't as appreciated as much as nick bosa is eric armstead and you know i may even have some video of eric armstead that we could play in a bit i did a whole film breakdown on him a little bit earlier maybe we can get that open here in a second i should have had it up and ready to go before the show but Armstead, I mean, he takes on a lot of double teams. But the thing about Eric is that he could play the five technique at the defensive end position, but he could also kick inside and play tackle. And when you look at this chart right here and you see all the red in column one and you see all the blue on the right side, there's one thing that changed in the 49ers defensive line between, col between columns one and then columns two and three. And that was that Eric Armstead moved full time to defensive tackle in week eight. So it goes weeks one to seven. Armstead is playing five tech on the outside and the 49ers are weak on the inside because they're playing either an injured Javon Kinlaw or Zach Kerr or whoever else next to DJ Jones on the inside. And then they say, screw this to hell with it. Kinlaw is season ending ACL surgery. They wave Zach Kerr and they get to a point in week eight where they say, we need to get better up the interior, up the middle to stop the run. They move Armstead to defensive tackle from week eight onward. As you can see right here, and I can even make this big for you guys, from week eight onward, the 49ers had the best de run defense in all of football. Here you go. Find where the 49ers are on this one. That's them right here on the vertical axis. They are head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of run defense. And that was all after Eric Armstead moved inside so the fact that he's so versatile allowed the 49ers with armstead and dj jones here, here's another good number for you this is run stop win rate by espn these are the top defensive tackles in football number one dj jones number two christian wilkins for the dolphins and three armstead for the 49ers the 49ers had two of the top three defensive tackles as far as run stop win rate for espn which allowed them to have the best run defense in football from week eight onward which led to this from week eight onward. You can see how it's all tied together. This is pass rush. All of this blue. So it's a cause and effect, right? Armstead Jones inside, best run defense in football. One of the best, if not the best, pass rushes in football that gets Burrow, Stafford, Rodgers, and Prescott five times each with sacks in those four games, critical games from weeks 14 to the divisional playoffs. Now, the reason that the 49ers lost the NFC title game, there are obviously several reasons in a team loss, but one of the main reasons they lost that game is because in the first half against the Rams, for some reason, they weren't able to stop the run the way that they had since essentially week eight. The Rams were able to get yardage on the ground in that first half, and that was able to mitigate some of the pressure. And instead of sacking Matt Stafford five times like they did in week 18, the 49ers only sacked him three times. Uh, twice. They only sacked him twice. So, so even less. Instead of hitting Matt Stafford, what, 14 times or 13 times like they did in week 18, the 49ers only hit him eight or nine times. So stopping the run is instrumental. The Rams stopped the run 
And because of that, they teed off on Jimmy Garoppolo. The 49ers weren't able to stop the run in the first half. And because of that, they got started late in teeing off on Matt Stafford. And they ultimately lost the NFC Championship game by three points. But uh, the key is, is, is still, you know, what we said it was. Nick Bosa and Eric Armstead, those two guys, because of their impact, were able to unleash everything else, to unleash the supporting cast. And, you know, one of the interesting members of the supporting cast for me is Charles Amenehu. Right before the trade deadline, the 49ers acquired a Menahu who's, you know, physically just so impressive. 6'5", 270-pound guy, can play the edge, but he's strong so he could set the edge against the run. But just, just, just his length is, is a deadly force potentially in the pass rush. And they pick him up from the Texans for a sixth-round pick. Now, this move was especially shrewd for the 49ers. Because Amenahu is not a rental just for 2021. He's also still under team control of his rookie contract for 2022. And Amenahu didn't have a lot of sacks for the 49ers. But look at the pass rush productivity rating. 9.0 from week 8 onward. And then 11.1, which is the best in this whole chart, from weeks 14 onward. This guy, as a situational rusher, was constantly getting in the face of quarterbacks was playing, you know, rollouts correctly, was disrupting. And, you know, pass rush is a lot about critical mass. You get quality body, quality body, quality body. And at a certain point, you have enough quality bodies to be overwhelming. And I think that the pickup of a Menahu, especially once he started working with Chris Kacerik, allowed the 49ers to get into this territory where the whole column is blue. So you, you talk about the tale of three phases. When did the 49ers reach the critical mass? Some somewhere in between weeks eight and fourteen, it 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 really really gelled. Now Armstead was a big reason. Moving inside was a big reason for all of that, and that's why we have to start talking about what the 49ers are going to do this off season to maintain the dynamic that they have. They have Armstead under contract, but remember the guy next to him on the inside is DJ Jones, and he's going to be a free agent. So how much is DJ Jones going to cost? I mean, we're talking potentially the best run stopping defensive tackle in football that also has some explosive pass rushing moves, that nice swim move against the Cowboys to get Prescott. I mean, he, he's not the best pass rushing defensive tackle in football, obviously. That title belongs to the guy in L.A., Aaron Donald. But D.J. Jones can hold his own. And when we talk about the importance of stopping the run to be that fire hydrant in the middle, he does it for the 49ers. So how much is he going to cost being a, a good pass rusher and a super athletic run stopper that can clog the middle? How much is that going to be? Is it going to be $5 million? Is it going to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten million? million? I'm not sure. Over the cap values, I'm at like 5.2. I think at that price, the 49ers go for it. But you have Robert Sala coaching the Jets. You have Mike McDaniel and, and you know a lot of the 49ers staff over in Miami right now. Those are two places that might be willing to play DJ Jones closer to 10. He might be worth overpaying if you're the 49ers, unless you really believe in Javon Kinlaw. Because as we saw this year, you need two dominant defensive tackles to make this wide nine work. And if you don't have DJ Jones, well, then you have Armstead and you have Kinlaw, I guess. But can you really rely on Kinlaw at this point? It would be a big gamble. I think in the ideal world, the 49ers somehow find a way to retain DJ Jones. And you do get Kinlaw back from injury, but there's not as much pressure on Kinlaw to be the guy. If Kinlaw becomes the guy anyway, Eric Armstead, that's the beauty of versatility. Armstead can kick back out the five technique where he's an excellent pass rusher. So that's the way that I look at this. I don't know if the budget will allow the 49ers to follow through with that plan, but it's something to watch for. And, you know, we go back to Kinlaw. He's a potential hinge point. If Javon Kinlaw delivers the way that he's supposed to, according to what the 49ers expected when they used that first round draft pick on him, then they have many fewer worries of defensive tackle. And then they maybe don't have to pay DJ Jones. But there's no way you can know that because we're sitting here talking about this in February and the season won't begin in September. And the season is also now 17 games long. The 49ers are coming off a 20 game season in which they played an NFL record 12 road games. And Along those lines, take a look at this. This is what's really impressive. This includes the playoffs. And I'm going to make this bigger. So look at the first column, snaps. They somehow were able to keep all of their players over the course of this 20-game season, all of their defensive linemen, under 
1,000 snaps. Everybody is under 1,000 snaps. Now, I think that's remarkable considering the fact that in 2016, before this current regime took over, DeForest Buckner over the course of a 16-game season, so four fewer games, was on the field for 1,006 snaps. So this is how much deeper the 49ers now are on the defensive line. They're able to divide up the workload to where Armstead has 979, Bosa's 975, Evicom comes in number three at 681. It's imperative to have a good defensive line that, that you are able to distribute the labor in this way. So uh, the, the 49ers depth pieces are what is going to make or break a lot of their success down the stretches of these seasons. And Javon Kinlaw, you know, even if he comes and turns it on, won't necessarily be a depth piece, but he'll be somebody that allows the depth pieces to shine because you have Kinlaw, Jones on the inside, Armstead could kick out the five technique. I'm just laying out a potential plan. And then you have your other guys, right? Kevin Gibbons, Contavia Street. I don't know who the 49ers will, will, um, keep and who, 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 who they won't hold on to. But you have Amenahu, Willis, Arden Key. All those players can play more specialized roles as rotational rushers, rotational defensive linemen. They're eating up snap count. They're fresh. Everybody is fresher. And the defensive line sings. You work as a unit up front, which is what makes Chris Kacarek so valuable because he brings some of these death pieces along, marginal players, and puts them into a situation where they're in the column at the right, where it doesn't matter who you are, you're giving a performance that's above average as, in terms of pass rushing productivity. Key cog this year, the 49ers have him under contract for next season is Sansom Ebucom. Ebucom really turned it on this past season. He was non-existent in weeks one to seven. So, so much so that people thought that he wouldn't play the second year of his two-year contract with the 49ers. 2.6 pass rush productivity rating is sorry. Not good. But then he was excellent from week eight onward. Ebucom figured it out, started roaring around the edge. Uh, he's got some power, too. I mean, he's an athletic rusher, but he's built in a way that can stymie the run, can take tackles on with power moves. And Ebucom's going to be back next year for the second year of his, of his two-year deal. It's needless to say, his performance over the final two weeks was definitely good enough. You go through some of the other names of the 49ers, Arden Key. Will he be back next year? Well, I mean, he might have priced himself out. And I mean, Key is, was this year's version of Kerry Hyder Jr., right? Player who had seen limited success at previous stops, at least as far as sack totals go. And, you know, it was three and three years for Key with the Raiders. And all of a sudden this year exploded for something like six and a half. And most of those came, if not all of those came after the 49ers moved him inside in week eight. Key is a lighter rusher, but if the 49ers can stop the run, he's a defensive end who can work against guards. If you stop the run, you earn the right to do this. If you don't stop the run, then Key is going to get eaten alive in the run game on the inside because he is a pass rusher. But if Armstead and Jones and Bosa and Ebucom, all those base down guys, stop the run, then Key could come in because second and four becomes second and seven, and third and three becomes third and six. That allows Arden Key to be in the football game. That allows Arden Key to work against guards. Arden Key's athletic enough to beat those guards. He's long and he's explosive. And you see the pass rush productivity rating soar through the roof. So will the 49ers be able to keep Key? Maybe other teams will say, oh, well, we don't want to pay this guy all too much because his success was reliant on the 49ers run defense and how they stopped everybody. If that ends up being the case, maybe he'll be more affordable. If that's not the case, well, that's why this guy right here is so important. Chris Kacarek has got to find the next Arden Key or the next Kerry Hyder Jr. next year to make the 49ers defensive line truly, truly sing. Because at the end of the day, this is a rush over coverage team. I read the Lynch quote at the start of this. The 49ers absolutely rely on the defensive line to be dominant. And if it's dominant, then you could see what they did this past season down the stretch. They can go places. And it all comes back to who they acquire, and how those players are developed. And that's why Chris Kacarek's in the title of this, and that's why Nick Bosa's in the title of this, because he's one of the players that really, really makes this machine churn. All right, we're 24 minutes in. Time to open this up to some questions. Any questions would be welcome. 
cut Ebucom to keep Key. I, I don't think it's going to work that way. Ebucom was, as you see here, uh, Arden Sansom Ebucom was really good for the 49ers from week eight onward. So you, you don't jettison good pass rushers who are under contract. And Ebucom right now qualifies as a good pass rusher for the 49ers. So um, Key is not under contract for 2022. You find a way to try to get him under contract if you can. But Ebucom, at least you still have for a year at $6 million, which is a good price for what he did down the stretch. More questions. And hey, we, have, we got a lot of viewers on right now. Everybody subscribe to the channel. We're growing steadily. The spike during the playoffs ended. We're not growing like 500 people a day anymore. But uh, we got the new camera. Got to show off the new camera, by the way, right here. Rush over coverage. Or maybe we should put... Here, maybe we should take that off and give everybody the written message. Subscribe to the channel there. But the camera is nice. My friend Trent's place is nice too, right? Look, he's got he's got a lot of wine back there. He had his golf clubs off to the side. He didn't want them in the background of the video though. So maybe maybe we'll do one more video this uh, this week to get into there tomorrow. Uh, no, maybe not tomorrow. Wednesday. Wednesday, I'm going to go to a sandwich place in, in Walnut Creek, and we're going to do a video from there. I It's one of my favorite sandwich places in the Bay Area. You can guess in – you can guess in there, – there, there may be a special visitor coming soon. If not, we'll do it in a different video. But you can guess in uh, the comment section where this might be. Here we go. Here comes Leon. Oh, boy. There he is. You got to look toward the camera. So this is Leon. This is Trent's dog. Trent and Hadley's dog. This is his uh, YouTube live debut. That portrait mode, you need to get closer to me. There, yeah. That way your, your uh, face is in focus. It's focusing on me and not him. All right, Leon, are you hungry? <laughs> Looks like he's hungry. He's looking for the next food. So he's a big 49ers fan too. Trent, Trent's a 49ers fan, so... I'm in a 49ers fan household right now. All right, Leon is off on his way. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys uh, use the um, chance to – Leon is a badass uh, from Quinn Price. We have a nice comment there. Um, let, let's, get some more, um, let's get some more questions here. What do you make of Steve Young and Joe Montana saying Trey Lance – is not ready. Well, at the very moment, Trey Lance isn't ready. I think it's common sense. It's one plus one equals two stuff, right? The guy had 318 passes at North Dakota State, and he didn't play for essentially over a year before starting with the 49ers in, in the two filling games this year. At this moment, Trey Lance isn't ready. If he was, he would have played over an injured Jimmy Garoppolo in the NFC playoffs. Garoppolo's playing with a fracture and a torn ligament in his thumb. If Trey Lance was ready with his talent, of course he would play. What matters is, will Trey Lance be ready in September after the most important offseason of his life? So we'll see how this offseason goes. But I, I believe in Trey Lance's talent more than anyone. I was sitting here last January, so 13 months ago, well before the 49ers made a trade, and I said the 49ers should look at drafting this guy Trey Lance because he's raw, but he's moldable clay for Kyle Shanahan and – the luxury of having Jimmy Garoppolo under contract puts the 49ers in a position where they can develop Trey Lance and make sure that he's ready in time. Now, if Trey Lance can be ready by this season, that the 49ers really feel that he's on the right track to be able to do that, they can trade Jimmy Garoppolo. They could get the capital in return for him. They could fortify the roster and they could also fortify the roster financially, right? Because Garoppolo's money won't be on the books. So, uh, people make controversy out of nothing. And Joe Montana and Steve Young are going to say what they say. But if uh, people just get offended at every single little word without putting into the context that I just did, then it's going to be a long off season just listening to tired takes over and over and over again. Did the 49ers adjust their wide nine late in the season? Seems like rush defense got better as the season went on. Yes, the 49ers fixed the gaps in the wide nine as the year went on. So the first time they played the Packers in week three versus the second time the 49ers played the Packers in the divisional playoffs, you could tell that the alignments, especially of the guys on the interior were slightly different. The three tech and the two I positions were much more flexible for the 49ers later in the season after they got some tape on their opponents and tape on themselves on how their opponents were beating them. So 
tweaking the gaps for the 49ers defensively and tweaking how they filled them allowed the run defense to be better? That is a great question. Yeah, I think that the 49ers will definitely draft another defensive lineman. It's always a good year to draft a D lineman. So I think they're going to see that this year because you look at potential free agency here, pending free agency, I should say, um, you know, Jordan Willis, I'm going to be a pending free agent, Arden Key, pending free agent, DJ Jones, pending free agent. Those are three important bodies that you're losing. They didn't get anything from Maurice Hurst this year, just a few snaps over two games because he was hurt, but he's also going to be a pending free agent. So, you know, maybe you sign some of these guys, but I think you have to keep that developmental pipeline rolling. And you take advantage of one of your best resources, which is Chris Kacarek. And if Chris Kacarek is still your defensive line coach, which he is, why not bring in a youngster that you could really work on? All right. Uh, any more questions? Could I see the 49ers drafting another two-gapping defensive tackle over corner in this draft? Yes. They, 49ers have been rush over coverage philosophically for a long time, and they'd like to get the corners through the veteran pool, through free agency. You know, you had Sherman. You had Jason Verrett. I don't know what they're going to do moving forward, but I think that they're, you know, especially if they can't pay DJ Jones, I think that they, they might really – they were working on Darian Daniels for a while. They thought that he might be able to develop. Because remember, DJ Jones was a sixth-round draft pick. Darian Daniels, undrafted free agent, who they liked. He was on their practice squad. Then he got hurt dancing during warm-ups of a practice this year. So I don't know where Daniels is at. We didn't see him from that point onward, so it must have been a fairly serious injury. But a rush-over coverage team. You should always be ready for them to potentially go in that draft a little bit early on to the defensive line instead of the instead of the um, um, uh, secondary. All right, guys. Red Eye says Trey Lance working with QB coach John Beck this offseason. Beck has coached Tom Brady, Russell Wilson, Stafford, amongst others. Beck and Tom House have performed a consulting firm coaching QBs in the NFL. That's all true. Thought it was a question, though. Well, do you think the 49ers will look for offensive line and defensive line in the draft to add uh, help? Yes, I think the fronts are the most important. The other day I made a video on the 49ers offensive line and the state of that position group. That one's really important to watch because the 49ers must be better there. In the defensive line, they have to find a way to sustain this. All right, everybody, thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed this video about the 49ers defensive line. Hope you enjoyed the guest appearance by Leon. And thank you to all for subscribing. If you haven't done so, make sure you do so right now. We'll talk to you all soon with another video coming up at this glorious place in Walnut Creek. I'm off to do a hike. Everybody take care. Oh, and we got food coming up on Wednesday, maybe even tomorrow, but for sure tune in on Wednesday. Leave in the comment section, leave what your favorite East Bay sandwich is. Any place in the East Bay. Could be out here. Could be in Walnut Creek. Could be in Oakland. Your favorite sandwich. Put it in the comment section. Maybe we do a quick show from there. All right, everybody take care and subscribe.